not what you're going to expect to hear from the librarian today, but you can Google it. <laughs> um, their books have lots of things to say about millennials. They're coddled, they're narcissistic, they're unfocused, they're spoiled, they're lazy, they're entitled, they're greedy, they're impatient, they're cocky, and they're fickle. But if, I think we might be looking at this with the wrong lens and using, an, and looking back to Tom Friedman, who, when he wrote his book, The World, uh, not The World is Flat, but the next one, uh, That Used to Be Us, he was interviewed on NPR one morning by Robert Siegel, and he gave the most brilliant 30 second elevator speech about how fast our technology is emerging. And rather than try to repeat it, I'm going to go, I'm going to share it with you. You know, Robert, I, I wrote a book, I started in 2004 called The World is Flat. And as I started working on this book, I went back and I reread The World is Flat, and I actually looked in the index, first edition, under F, and I realized Facebook wasn't it. <laughs> when I wrote The World is Flat, I said, the world is flat. Yeah, we're all connected. Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was a sound. The cloud was in the sky. Fort Hang was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. Applications were what you sent to college. And Skype, for most people, was a typo. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Why would I try to recreate that? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> so it occurs to me that we might be judging these kids unfairly, and that we might be using an old f frame of reference for some entirely new landscape. And the question becomes, are they really coddled? It's hard to find a graphic for coddled. Um, or maybe they're just resourceful. Or are they narcissistic? Perhaps they're just transparent. Are they unfocused? Maybe they're hyper-focused. And can we really fault, if we have helicopter parents out there that are trying to guide their children's lives, we can't really fault their offspring for taking advantage of that. That's resourcefulness. <laughs> is taking a selfie narcissistic, or is it just a way to connect with the world? Are they really unfocused? I don't think so. I think it depends on what we're asking them to focus on. And what they're doing matters. If they can be remarkably focused when they're doing things, not watching things, not listening to things, but literally doing things. And one thing is certain is they are impatient. And that is not a bad thing. As Chelsea Clinton put it, it's their urgency not arrogance that drives their impatience. And one thing is clear for me as a 20-year as a educator is that passive learning is not working for these kids. Statistically speaking, they will remember 10% of what they hear, less than 10% of what they hear in a lecture situation. And that statistic applies to prior generations. I'm guessing, and this is total speculation, that it's significantly different for this generation. So it's important and incumbent upon us to teach them to become independent learners. And this requires us to do something very important and something we're not entirely comfortable with, and that is to trust them. We have to trust them too. Take the lead. Question our questions. Research and investigate. And I'm going to pause for just a second to point out that this the notion of questioning things, being a careful reader, and publishing your work is the essential element behind the Common Core's research standards. They need to take risks. They have to seek inspiration. They need to ask the experts. And I'm going to pause again to say, in order to ask the experts, we need to give them permission to connect with those experts via the medium that are most comfortable for both the experts and the students. So they need access to these tools. We want them to create new things. We want them to reflect. Take the time. Give the time. We want them to visualize where they're going. Try stuff. Persevere. Not their strength. Ask for feedback. I'll share that that student was at that moment asking for guidance on how to ask a girl to the prom. And when I came to work yesterday, the entire library was stopped. Because all activity had stopped because he was in the middle of his prom-ozal. 
she said yes. <laughs> they need to own their learning, and they need to embrace mistakes. And Emily is charmingly putting together a blooper. She's part of the bloopers for a video that we use with the school. But I want to stop for just a minute out of this list and talk a little bit about mistakes. Because one thing is certain, they are guaranteed. They will miss, make mistakes, they will fail, they will face challenges, they will meet obstacles. But it's how we teach them to cope with those things and how to overcome them that is really critical. And by involving them in the solution, they become part of the solution. It's very empowering. So now we can go back to our list. <laughs> we want to trust them to plan ahead and to teach the teacher, even the little ones, and to help their peers, and to learn from the web. And that, too, is very scary in education world. So we indoctrinate our freshmen on the very first day of their high school career by pulling them into an assembly after all the big kids go home, and we share with them a video. Um, they, they, a whole series of people parade through the auditorium and the, the athletic director and visual arts and the PTA and so forth. And then the library program steps up and shows this video, which is put together by the students of the prior year on the very last day of the prior school year. And there is a really fundamental underlying message to that. You have access to all kinds of way cool tools in this school library. It's different from middle school and, and, we trust you. And there's a responsibility associated with that. So you might be wondering what this actually looks like in practice. And I'm going to share with you three examples. Um, and one of them is actually just from this week. Um, so this is Mrs. Potts. She is the, the principal at East School in New Canaan, Connecticut, um, which is the district where I teach. And she is there with her students. And a couple of months ago, she contacted our principal and said, hey, you know what? We really want to build a stronger reading culture among particularly boys, but most of our students in the fourth grade. And could you have your kids put together a video to you know, show that, that big kids read too, that it's cool? And my principal said, I'll ask the librarians, which is yay, score one for librarians. Um, and so librarians who love delegating, you might not know this about us, but we love delegating, we have to, um, contacts George. And George is um, basically our intern this year in the school library. And we said, I said, George, you know, um, we really need to do something for this elementary school kid. So George, in the meantime, has literally fallen in love with an application called Erasmus. And before I go any further into the story, I think I need to pause and tell you a little bit about Erasmus because otherwise it's going to make no sense. So what I'm about to show you is an app called Erasmus, and it is an augmented reality app. So you would record multimedia and then superimpose it on an image that triggers the multimedia to appear. There are lots of creative ways you can use this. Ours is actually very similar to what it would be if it was a QR code, but it eliminates a lot of steps for us. So what we did was we recorded students talking about books that they loved, and then we used the book cover itself as a trigger. So here's how it works. Possibly these photos. Yes. I blame you for being up until 2 o'clock every morning this week because I can't put that book down. And of course, here's a snapshot of what it looks like when kids see it for the first time. Okay, and... Oh, oh my god. It's a person. So is that? So like, is George that, um, yeah. he's talking about the book? Yes. That's insane. <laughs> he's holding the book up. Oh, oh like, my god. <laughs> Oh, it's about for what? That's such a good watch. Because you hold up the book and put the last one back. Money, Russ! And so that's Erasmus. So, of course, George, when I talked to him about the video, says, well, I want to do a video. Let's use Erasmus. So I thought, well, what a great idea. So I said, okay, you're in charge. You need to you know, make the arrangements. Here's the name of the person you need to get in touch with and make it happen. So George pulled together a team, 
of good friends, and it's really a great team because we have a we have a, 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 fire, a future firefighter, we have a football player, and we have George who was who struggled with dyslexia as a child. Um, and we put them together, and they coordinated five trips to the middle school to go work with the fourth graders to teach them how to use Erasmus. So this is the students actually recording their own videos and then overlaying them on the books and talking about books that they love and sharing that with their classmates and organically creating a culture around reading that is really different from what they're used to, that is student-driven, not teacher-driven, and that really inspires them to do more and create more and learn more and read more and <coughs> share their stories about the stories that they're learnt reading. So what we built with these fourth graders who are now trained in this is a path to the future so that they can train the next year's fourth graders. They can come from the middle school down to the elementary school and train them and move up. And we can build over the K-12 experience this strong culture of reading around this application so that by the time they get to the first day of their freshman year, right before they share that video, they will already have ingrained in them the ability to share their stories about the stories they are reading and be passionate about exchanging them. And the technology may change, but the culture will be there. So here's our second example. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of being part of a model UN club, but it's an amazing thing to see. Um, you can have up to 3,000 students running around a hotel conference room, a conference, in business attire, trying to solve the world's problems in small committees in business attire. I said that, right? <laughs> For 14-hour days. It's incredible. So we are so impressed by this. We have a very strong model UN club, 120 kids. Um, that we create a simulation for our entire sophomore class as a culminating experience of their history experience from Fred Jones' sophomore year. And so we have, 200, we have 300 students participating, 180 of whom are delegates. And so this is the delegates. So the entire event is organized by students, the Model UN Club, and we literally teachers stand in the back of the room the whole day. That's all that happens. Um, so what happens that 120 kids that were not delegates, that was a problem for a long time. So what we decided to do was make them the press corps. And so we, they are assigned two rooms to cover and a medium to use to cover those two rooms. So for the students who do not have an iPhone or some kind of a device where they can actually do the documenting, we hand them an iPod or an iPad or whatever it is that they want. We loan them something from the library. And then we give them a press badge. Um, and we send them off to report about what it is that they are seeing. And we, chant, we, we can watch the, the back channel in, in the press room, so we follow what they're saying and what they're documenting. And you can imagine what a godsend this is for this librarian who used to have to do all this work themselves. So this is great. All I do is watch the streams come in. Um, so we can also monitor what they're doing, which also is very helpful. Um, so there are three social media platforms that we use in order to have them document. One is Facebook, one is Twitter, and one is Flickr. And they use their mobile technology to go out and express, broadcast it live all day long. Um, and this is what it looks like. And on Facebook, this is just one of the Facebook, a screenshot of the Facebook post, but I love this one because the kids posted this. Oh, look at the sibling love and dissect. So this is an older sibling who's part of the Model UN Club congratulating his sister for having won an award that day. <laughs> All right, now I'm on to my first reason, or my, my last reason, and it's a really different one. So this is the icon for Google Voice, which I think personally is the most underutilized Google application tool in education. Um, it is a, it's basically a phone service, and you can use it to forward calls. We forward to uh, five, five phone, landline phones. Um, in our library. Um, call forwarding also empowers you to uh, it transcribes voicemails and sends them to your email inbox. This whole thing is set up with one email account. That's it. No money exchange, no nothing. It's free. Um, so you can have the voicemail inputs. Phone calls come in, the voicemail goes in. Text messages also go to your email inbox. You're, I can see you're sitting there going, what? Um, there's an app for that. And this is what an email looks like, email inbox looks like when it's full of voice messages and text messages. And obviously it's blanked out to protect the privacy of people who are participating in these conversations. You can also log into the Google Voice website and see your transcription of all the texts that have come in, which is a great data collection tool, as you will see in one minute. 
And this is what the app looks like. So the beauty of the app is that you can get an incoming text and quickly use your voice to text on your phone and answer very quickly. So a response can happen in under 30 seconds. Very simple. We encourage our students to reach out in real time with questions and concerns that they have about the work that they are doing. We have a 24-7 library. And this is, the, our, this is our email signature. And this is the last page of every single set of instructions that we post online. And our thinking is this. You know the saying, right? They will come. And this is actually the word cloud, and a word cloud actually gives priority to the words that most prominently come up, that come up most frequently in a body of text. So you can see the high priority words, and if you can probably tell that the, number one is high. I love how polite they are. Number two is thank. Really, really important. Um, so our students, this is, about, this is basically the word cloud of all the text messages we've received this year. And interestingly enough, sometimes you have to kind of manipulate these things to hit, take out things like Norwalk and Westport and New Canaan. Um, but the one thing I had to take out was PM. <laughs> because every single one of them is done, is sent late at night. Wow. There are 180 of these this year. And it's really interesting to see what they're asking. This gives us a really genuine live documentation of what kids don't know. It's so powerful. It's powerful for our instruction. It's powerful for them because it empowers them. And the kids who are sending the texts are not this kid. <laughs> These texts are coming in basically anonymously unless they say who they are. And they, they know very well that we have no sense of what their teacher deadlines are. So if they're behind the eight ball and they're sending this in late and they're doing this at the last minute, I have no idea. I really don't know. I can't keep track of all that. They know that. So they're very, very comfortable sending out questions this way. Way more than that kid. So what we're thinking about in terms of the future where this might go is to offer virtual library office hours a couple of nights a week from basically 8 to 10. They'd probably prefer 9 to 11. I'm not sure they can find a librarian who has to be at work at 7.30 in the morning to do that. But this is a real viable option for where this could go in the future. And what it does for our learners is it really helps to make them self-directed. So our emerging technologies really empowers the kids to become independent learners. And I want to share just very quickly, David Lankes, who's a professor at Syracuse University School of Information and Library Science, wrote a blog post in 2012, and it was really more, it was actually kind of about, you know, we need to stop yelling about saving libraries and just stand on our own record. But one of the things he said that I thought was most salient was that in order, we need to transform libraries, but in order to do that, we're not going to do it through a building, we're not going to do it through a collection, we're not going to do it through services, but not even the librarians are going to make that difference. The test of a truly transformed library is in the achievements of its community. And so we need to empower our learners' achievements and our millennials' achievements. And there are three, there are some things we need to do in order to get this done. And I'm going to go back to my three, because I like three. Um, and I'm going to give you like this little thing to remember, because this will help you remember it. When you're long gone and you're, what were the three things? Here, or here they are. It's DM 24-7. It's got to be digital. And I don't mean just e-books. Like, I'm kind of miffed about that illustration. What I really want is everything we do face-to-face -face has to have a digital component whether it be teaching or programming or this, this is important. We have to make it available online. It has to be mobile. This is my colleague's grandson. And when she showed me this picture, I said, oh, isn't he cute? It doesn't have an earache. She said, no, no, he thinks it's a bone. <laughs> <laughs> so our services have to be smaller than that raspberry. They also have to be 24-7. When these kids are sending in their texts, they're, we're expecting them to be 24-7 learners. We have to provide 24-7 services in order to empower that. So there you go, DM 24-7. All right, so it's time for us to celebrate.
these millennials, because they bring gifts. They're truly awesome. And if we just watch and listen and learn from them, together we can do some amazing tinkering.